This is the current federal tax developments for the week of January the 25th, 2021. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zollers, broadcasting this morning on a Sunday morning from a rather rainy uh, Phoenix right now. And we'll take a look at what's been going on this week in the area of federal taxes and related programs. And this week's been kind of busy. We've had a lot of guidance. Let's talk about a couple of guidance that is directly tax related. First, the IRS put out a procedure that will give some penalty relief related to partners tax basis capital account reporting on the 2020 returns. We also had a notice, actually a notice on their website, posted late on Friday, apparently, that, that gives us some limited guidance about when we can use the catch-up calculation on a fourth quarter 941. And the group so far at the IRS has allowed to use that catch-up to get the employee retention credit. It's going to be a very small and uh, kind of odd group that would be allowed, but basically I wouldn't get too worried about doing that fourth quarter 941 catch up for ERC you didn't claim in quarters two and quarters three that you now believe you have access to under the new law. We'll talk about why, what this might mean, and what we need to be watching for going forward. We also then had a lot of guidance from the SBA on the new PPP loan programs as revised at the end of the year under the Consolidated Appropriations Act. First, we'll talk about a revised PPP first draw maximum loan uh, calculation FAQ. We also have some procedures from the SBA, one in particular that talks about what happens to borrowers that got a loan that turns out to have been in excess of what they were actually allowed. And we'll talk about and whether it matters if the error was due to the borrower including too much in the way of expenses because they misunderstood the guidance or if the problem it comes from the bank. So we'll look at both of those. We'll also take a look at some second disbursements uh, guidance we got for PPP first draw loans. You know, Congress allowed in limited cases some borrowers who had already received their first draw loans to go ahead and get a additional disbursement on that first draw loans. We'll talk about what the SBA sees as allowed for that group. We're going to talk about the uh, guidance the SBA put out that was important on the calculation of gross revenue, gross receipts under the second draw program, and more specifically, some more complete guidance of what counts for -for not-for-profit organizations. And finally, we'll discuss the fact that we got the revised PPP loan application forms for forgiveness, which will be the 3508 series, the regular, the 3508 EZ and the 3508S and what they all apply and where we go with those these days. So let's start with the straight up, not the end of the year tax law guidance, the one piece we have to discuss this week, which came at us in notice 2021-13 that was issued on January 20th. And this deals with the new requirements that partnerships have to report their capital on the 1065 K1s using the partner's tax basis capital. No longer will taxpayers be allowed to file those returns using GAAP or 704B or some other method of reporting partner's capital. Partner's capital on the K-1 is required to be reported using the tax basis. That was part of the draft uh, instructions for this year's 1065 K-1s. And basically, we're not backing off of that. So we're going to see that requirement in place. What this does is deals with the problem. What if you don't get it right? What happens if you foul up on the potential on giving partners capital? If you give the wrong number or you just decide I'm not doing it. Okay, let's talk about those options. Because this particular notice, 2021-13, gives us a nice list of penalties that might apply. So if you do not properly complete the partner's capital on the K-1s, uh, you know, for the various re- for the various partners you have, well, the IRS wants to point out the following penalties may apply, and that includes the Section 6698 penalty for essentially failing to file the partnership tax return. 
And as we know, if you have very many partners, that one adds up pretty quickly. So we have that potential problem. The goal here is you are required to complete the returns in the manner that is stated in the instructions. And I need to make a clarification here. While we all should know that instructions are not considered to be binding on the tax court or any other court as far as you know requirements for positions on returns, you do need to be aware that the regulations uh, that the IRS has issued and the code does require you, though, to complete the return in line with the instructions in place. So you can't ignore an instruction to provide information by saying, I don't want to. That's not going to work, basically, if that information, as long as that information would be helpful to the service. And the courts have been very broad in looking at what's considered helpful information for the IRS. So basically, if you're thinking, we're not going to do it, I refuse to do that, that's wonderful. But it's kind of like saying, you know, unless you're planning to be Henry David Thoreau and want to know why all the other CPAs aren't in jail with you, may not be the best approach to go forward. So we're going to talk about that. Otherwise, there are also two other penalties you get nailed with because the K-1 is considered to be an information return. So just like not filing the 1099s timely when you're required to issue 1099s, the same pair of penalties apply here. One penalty for failing to send the copy of the information return to the IRS timely, which means it's a second late filing problem for the partnership return. Plus, there is a penalty for not providing proper information returns to the partners, each partner timely. So again, those penalties add up. And finally, there is more than a slight possibility that the IRS might uh, also be able to impose a Section 6662 penalty, which is your accuracy-related penalty, on a partnership tax exam if somehow, based on you know your failure to properly compute partners' capital, we discover an adjustment that should have been made in allocations that wasn't properly taken care of or otherwise redistribute things. So that's also a penalty. This particular guidance will cover all three penalties. Or I should say all four penalties that we talked about there. And what they will do in this guidance is a very limited penalty relief procedure. And it talks about both the late filing and the information return. So if we want to talk about this, the real issue here is the relief is solely if you do not come up with a proper beginning capital number. Now, you know, we're, if you read the instructions, it tells you about the methods that are available for getting a beginning capital account number. Effectively, if you've been reporting tax basis, you're supposed to go ahead and just pick up what you had last year. If you aren't, weren't using tax basis, but you have it, you go ahead and use that. If you don't have it, you know, we don't have tax basis numbers, we haven't maintained them, we cannot easily reconstruct them, then we're allowed to use, essentially, either ask the individual partners for their outside basis and back off the debt allocated. We're allowed to do the computation we'd normally do under 754 elections for a 743B adjustment or 734 adjustment, which is the deem sale, figure out the cash that would go to that partner, and then turn around and take from the K-1 gains losses that would have been taken place and what would have been allocated this partner, subtract off the gains they would have gotten, add back the losses, and that essentially gives you their share of inside basis. That's option two. And option three is if you have 704B capital accounts, which in theory everybody's keeping, right? Because the partnership agreement tells us that's what we're supposed to be keeping and that's what we're going to use in liquidation. Then you would take your 704B capital account numbers, but then back off them to the extent that you're looking at a 704C adjustment that has not been fully recovered that's inherent in those numbers. So those are your options. If you come up with a number that's none of the above, you know, you basically, you, you may foul up the calculation, get it wrong, there may be errors, you will be able, under this notice, to obtain relief as long as you can show you exercise ordinary and prudent business care in attempting to properly compute the beginning capital. 
And the notice defines this as a standard of care that a reasonably prudent person would use under circumstances in the course of his business in handling account information. Goes on to state in demonstrating ordinary and business care, taxpayers are reminded that capital account balances are part of a partnership's books and records and must be maintained accordingly. Seems honestly that this relief is not terribly far off from what you would have qualified for anyway, because it does point out that, in fact, you know, you still could have gotten reasonable cause exceptions. If you can show that the misstatement was due to, you know, reasonable cause and not intentional, you know, failure to file the requirements or failure to follow the requirements, then you should be able to get relief. So I'm not sure this notice provides us with the best option since it appears that almost in any case this would have applied, you're pretty close to reasonable cause. So in the back of my mind, I'm trying to figure out when we could do this, but we couldn't qualify for reasonable cause. And I guess maybe it might apply to a partnership that used an outside CPA firm where this outside CPA firm or outside preparer did not attempt to do a tax basis capital account, never explained the issue to the uh, partnership, the CPA or the outside preparer decided I'm not going to do it and they weren't aware of that. That might be a case where reasonable cause might not work, but I still think you'd probably get it there. You know, so it seems like an odd situation this notice would give relief. But it does make it very clear that this relief does not apply to the actual transactional calculation once you get the beginning balance for the current year's adjustments. Presumably, it would also not apply if you failed to uh, take into account that 743B adjustment that we talked about that you're supposed to be taking off the books if you had it on the books. Remember, we discussed that previously, the 743B adjustment is supposed to be taken off the books. We're not supposed to have that uh, on the books. And I know a lot of CPAs, I've heard, I, I've heard a number of arguments and I've gotten into it in courses with people saying that's not right. You're supposed to put that on there. I've been doing it that way for 30 years. And I can only say whether you like it or not, the service does not want it on there. It is a memo entry. It is not part of capital. And you are told right now you are supposed to make sure it's not in your capital account computation. So whether we like it or not, you know, you need to understand that that needs to be backed off. And probably the most important takeaway of this notice is I think it really does tell us that the service plans to be serious here. And I would not be surprised to see them penalize partnerships on exam when they discover that these rules are not being followed. So it, it's more serious than you might think is the way I'd phrase it. There's also the potential, like I said, 6662 relief, but again, limited to the loan computation of the beginning capital and then for any other, like ending capital, only to the extent it goes back to that initial blown computation. So it's very limited relief. As I said, I think it's primarily relief that is there to, you know, tell us they're going to get more serious about this. In essence, look, we, we granted this to show you how narrowly we plan to be nice about giving relief if people say I'm not going to do it because they've seen a lot of pushback. So just be aware of that. Next up, that this was like a Friday evening surprise, the IRS on their website in an area that is solely related to forms information, put up a page that says, didn't get requested PPP loan forgiveness. You can claim the employee retention credit for 2020 on the fourth quarter form 941. Now, we don't want to overreact to this notice, but we need to be aware of it. If you may remember, in the Taxpayer Certainty and Disaster Relief, Disaster Tax Relief Act, get the right name of there, of 2020 under Section 206, we had a number of changes made to the employee retention credit for 2020. And one of the main ones was you could still get the ERC if you, even if you applied for and received a PPP loan, regardless of whether you got forgiveness or not, but there was a caveat that you couldn't duplicate. So if you claim the wages for the employee retention credit, 
you are going to be unable to use those wages to get PPP loan forgiveness. You can't duplicate there. Now, the law also said there were to be an election under, as if it had been in the CARES Act from the beginning, Section 2301G1, which 2301 is where we have the employee retention credit, and it's not in the Internal Revenue Code. It's still in the CARES Act only. That says that the IRS will provide an option where you can elect to take certain wages that would qualify for the ERC and say, I'm not claiming that benefit. That indicates presumably that if you don't do that, every wage that would qualify for ERC is going to be used for ERC, and that would bar you from using them for forgiveness. Now, that's what the law says. It also has provision at G2 that says if for some reason you didn't, you know, you did say I'm not going to use them, and then you're later denied forgiveness, that you would be able to then have a procedure to be able to use those wages to go back and get your ERC. Okay, that's the background to understand. What the IRS has said in this guidance, which you can read, and we've got it linked to in our materials for this week. If you go there, it's on the website. We discuss it as well. Uh, the IRS indicates that right now, the only system they are putting in for using a special rule. In the Section 206, a special rule was provided that you could claim the unused second and third quarter credits. And I think technically it should really still say first, but let's ignore that. Uh, really, that, that late first quarter became second, as I recall the historical guidance on this. So you could take that excess credit, that, you, that credit you didn't take earlier in the year, in 2020, and you could effectively move it on to the fourth quarter 941. Okay, that's great. Well, the IRS at this point has given us guidance only for a case that is essentially if you had filed the PPP loan, right, and you'd included wages in the second or third quarter of 2020 as payroll costs in support of an application to obtain forgiveness rather than claiming the ERC for those wages and your forgiveness was denied, then you can use that special catch-up on the fourth quarter 941. Now, be careful before you overreact to this, because I will put it straight. They never tell us here this is the only way you can get the ERC for 2020, is if you have full denial. They also don't even technically state that you couldn't use the fourth quarter catch-up otherwise, but they've given us no method to do it yet. And we're getting awfully close to January 31st. If you are in that likely very small group that applied for a PPP loan, put those wages on an application for forgiveness, and had a denial already, then they tell you exactly how to claim it. If not, then we don't know where you stand right now, except it appears very iffy trying to claim the fourth quarter. That said, you know, now the IRS does make clear since they published this on Friday. And remember, these, not these basically 941s for the fourth quarter are due technically by next Monday, technically by February 1st, because January 31st will fall on a Sunday. So, you know, they're coming up due, and they do admit that given the short time frame, many, many people will find it difficult to get their systems up to do this calculation to put on the fourth quarter 941. So they do remind us that you can file a Form 941X to claim this refund. My concern there is obviously how much time will it take the IRS to get around to looking at 941Xs, but again, open issue. We don't know it. So the question is, where are we right now? Well, I think a key issue right now is that we've not yet had any guidance from the IRS on a provision that was added to the employee retention credit by the Taxpayer Certainty and Disaster Tax Relief Act of 2020. It put new section G1. Now, as I said, G2 says if you're denied, you can get the credit, and they're using G2 for this quarter for catch-up. But we've yet to hear from G1, and G1's interesting 
because it says this section, meaning the employee retention credit, shall not apply to so much of the qualified wages paid by an employer, qualified eligible employer, as such employer elects at such time and in such manner as the secretary may prescribe. And that's important because we don't have that yet to not take into account for purposes of this section, that is for the ERC. That section implies that until we make that election, however it is to be made, technically any wages that could qualify for ERC credit, the ERC credit, can't be used for PPP loan forgiveness because, you know, apparently we are supposed to use them on the 941. My guess is we have no other guidance about how to get the 2020 credits yet because the service is still trying to figure out how to make 2301 G1 work and more importantly, how to coordinate with the Small Business Administration. Because if you are the IRS, you realize you're going to get hammered on this two ways as an agency. Way number one, which we'll probably hear about this week, is that you are putting bureaucratic roadblocks in the way of taxpayers getting this relief that Congress wanted out there right now. Okay, Now, we're going to do probably a repeat of the original CARES Act in this area, just like we had for the PPP loans. So initially, it's like, get the money out, get the money out, get the money out. We know that pressure's there. And I would expect to hear from people this week on that. But then a few weeks, maybe a month or two later, the stories will start hitting the press about companies that got full forgiveness and put those exact same wages on the 941. And the IRS has paid out the refund and the SBA is forgiven. And can you believe the government agencies didn't catch the fraud? So it's kind of a rock and a hard place problem, which I understand at the moment as to why we have this. The problem is, though, it is getting in the way of actually getting relief out. And unfortunately, I'd feel a lot better if our leaders in Congress, instead of going on TV and giving sound bites for each one of those two things, and if you're really somebody who you know has no shame, you will go out and claim about the bureaucratic mess this week, and then you'll go right back on two weeks from now and three weeks from now, and on the fraud, you know, berate them for not putting procedures in place to stop the fraud. World, you can have either money go out quickly and then there's going to be a fraud provision because there are people out there looking to get free money free money is always going to attract that crowd or you can try to lock it down so that free money crowd doesn't get the money but when you do that you're going to put roadblocks in the way of anybody getting money quickly which is going to go against your whole relief provision so like it or not i understand where we're at i'm frustrated for my clients that do need the money But I also realized that having gone through the Ruth Chris, uh, Shake Shack, and, uh, you know, Potbelly, I always have to remember, I always forget Potbelly of the three. That fiasco back in the PP loan program where we had Congress people going on TV and just, I'm shocked, I'm shocked this fraud is out there. You know, I mean, that's the problem we're going to be facing here. So, again, that whole scenario They're trying to avoid that, but that's going to slow things up, whether you like it or not. Okay, the other stuff we got this week is primarily guidance from the SBA. And this is mainly FAQs we ended up getting. And we have first one, the Paycheck Protection Program, how to calculate the maximum loan amount for first draw PP loans and what documentation to provide by business type. That was issued by the Small Business Administration on January 17th, right? And this essentially talks about how we're going to use our payroll costs and other issues and what exactly has to be given to back this up. And what this gives us is the specific changes with many of the new calculations under first draw loans. We have a discussion there about how we can do the revised calculation for farmers and ranchers who are self-employed and report on Schedule F and can elect to use their gross revenue instead of net income. As I mentioned, we talked about the program in general. It doesn't make any difference if your farm had more than 100,000 net in 2019 you know, or 2020, whichever year you're going to use for testing, because you're still going to be capped 100 grand. But if you had, if you were less 100 grand of, of net income or you were at a loss, Uh, Then the gross revenue works. This talks about how a farmer would do that, the basic calculation. It is limited to self-employed. So, I mean, it is limited to those who file Schedule F. So partnerships aren't going to get it. 
S corps aren't going to get it, and C corps aren't going to get it. It's going to be only the partnerships. Okay. Also, tell us if you're a partnership and you're applying for 2020 numbers. Uh, bottom line, if you want to use 2020, and the same thing will be true for Schedule C borrowers as well, if you want to use 2020 payroll numbers instead of 2019 numbers to get your loan, your PPP loan, and this would apply for either first draw or second draw, well, you've got to complete the forms. And if it's a partnership, you have to complete an entire 1065 to provide for them. Now, it does not have to be filed with the IRS yet because actually we can't. As I recall, still kind of stuck there. I don't think they're accepting the 2020 1065s at this point. But we have to certify that we will file that exact document when we're able to file with the IRS. So we will have to complete that. The same thing will be true about Schedule Cs. If you're going to use 2020, and again, you have to be consistent. If I want 2020's payroll for my employees, I have to use 2020 Schedule C for my income. If I want to use 2019 Schedule C for my income, I'm going to have to use 2019 for the employees. I have to be consistent in that realm. They also reminded us about S Corporation, 2% or greater shareholders, that any amounts paid for group health, life, disability, vision, and dental insurance for an S Corporation is more than 2%. They are considered cash wages. That's true even if they're less than 5% or they have or they have no ownership because this is the indirect ownership because we're a family member that's still going to go into their cash wage computation, not their additional payroll costs. Why that's important is because the cash wage is going to be capped at 100000 annualized while the additional payroll costs are on top of that. So obviously greater than 2% shareholders. If you're not an owner, you're not going to be capped to the two and a half month uh, calculation for forgiveness, but you are going to be capped based on the total over 100,000 limitation, which is going to run you into a potential issue with these costs going into that calculation rather than being separate and added on. We have an additional discussion here, which helps clarify something. At least I think it does. You have to kind of read it. If you were not in operation for the entire year prior to February 15th, 2020, they have there the calculation about how you're going to do and you're going to get your payrolls for each month. Now, you do have to be in business on February 15th, 2020. But this kind of makes it clear because when you read the law, you're wondering, does this only work if you opened up exactly on February 15th, 2020? And it appears as long as you were not open on February 15, 2019, you were not in operation for the entire year, right, prior to this date. So let's say I opened up in March or April of 2019, I'd be considered under the new entity calculation, and I would use every month's payroll coming forward instead of using 2019's payroll. That That's kind of how it would work. They have a computation there. We also have the same rule for self-employed individuals and partnerships that have that same. They started up after February 15, 2019, but before February 15, 2020. We were talked about, they gave some clarifications on various fringe benefits that would calculate for this and payroll costs. So they make it very clear to remind you that, yes, you do not get loans based on the Social Security taxes imposed on the employer. Those don't count. They're not forgivable, right? We don't get that side either. And we saw a lot of banks and some vendors and some uh, some applicants uh, go include those in there. To be honest, because some of the worksheets, which is what I warn people about being very, very careful this early while we're trying to interpret a program, there are lots of people that have put together worksheets, organizations that have worksheets and spreadsheets and other items. Those are all tentative. Now, you know, and I hear a lot of people complain about the AICPA worksheets back in the last program. Well, that didn't work. They were wrong. You know, why they get it wrong? It's like they got it wrong because there was no guidance. And they frankly said every time that this is based on the interpretation, it may change. If you went ahead and used that worksheet and ignored the warnings, I think the problem is more on you than it is on them because they did make it clear. You've got to read all the warnings and those warnings apply right now. For anybody trying to use all the guides we have here until we get SBA to actually tell us how everything works. And that's really true. I've heard people asking for ERC calculators. And gang, 
we are missing tons of IRS guidance. And any calculator you have right now is at best a tentative calculator. And you better not rely on it. And you're not going to be able to come back crying later saying that, well, I did it that way. And now they want to penalize me because it turns out it actually was wrong. Reality is sometimes you have to face the fact that with new laws, we just don't know for a while. I realize we want the relief right now, but we don't know. So be careful there is what you're doing. And they also clarify corporate groups have the basically limitation of $20 million on first draw. Next, we had uh, a SBA procedural notice that is concerning, and it goes back to that whole bit about the confusion with a new law. This is like the textbook example of why I'm warning you. Be very, very careful with those spreadsheets and other things you're grabbing from places that make it, quote, easy to compute under the new law. Be very, very careful with those because the other problem we have with people is even when an organization like the AICPA regularly updated those worksheets whenever guidance came out that would change the calculation that they had originally assumed would be the way it would work. But unfortunately, a lot of people grab that spreadsheet and never go back and check. Do not use any spreadsheet unless you have double-checked that the version you're using is the most current version that organization or that group may be providing. You're going to get yourself in trouble. This is example one of doing it. Early in the PPP loan program, we had a lot of worksheets, especially around that crazy part of the law that talked about what was considered cash compensation and whether payroll taxes had to come out. If they didn't come out, did we add back everything? And we saw some calculators ended up using net payroll, which honestly is what the law said, at least kind of for certain periods. It's horribly written. And the SBA, they spent a lot of time trying to write a justification I think, frankly, is wrong, but nobody's going to challenge it. So I understand why they did it. But when they had to write that long of an explanation, you knew that they were struggling. You know, to say that it's gross payroll, that was clearly the intent, but that was not what the law said. So the early spreadsheets before the SBA came out with that notice had various ways of computing payroll costs. And a lot of people got the spreadsheets and they just put the numbers in and, you know, submitted applications based on that. Banks may or may not have noticed that. Secondly, some of the foul up come from the banks themselves. There were banks putting out uh, spreadsheets that actually did automatically add in the employer FICA. So it's not all like AICPA, payroll services, other groups that were putting out these spreadsheets. It included the very lenders who would then approve the loan based on that number and submit it to the SBA. And the SBA was approving most anything at that point, so people got loans that were either too much or too little. This notice concentrates on those loans that were too much. Regardless of whether you got too much due to a bank error or due to the borrower's error, you have to repay. You cannot get forgiveness on that number. This makes it very clear. And this makes it clear that if either the borrower or the lender become aware that the loan was for too much, they have to notify. So a borrower has to notify the lender if they become aware their loan was for more than it should be. And the lender has to notify the borrower if the lender notices, hey, they shouldn't have qualified for this much, right? That's going to be the way it works. If that's true, you're going to be forced to pay apparently over the two years or five years, the amount of the excess that occurred, unless, you know, if it was for ju just a, you know, common error, it wasn't fraudulent, you know, it was just a simple mistake, you're still going to have to pay it back. There'll, there'll be no option to roll that into the next issue. Now, here's the catch. Some people got to be careful with this. While the change in SBA guidance, there is a provision that says whatever the guidance was at the date you got the loan, even if later guidance said that your loan number, you know, should have been less, you could still keep the amount, you know, if the, if the guidance changed. It's become very, very clear that the SBA is interpreting that very, very narrowly. In many of these cases, the SBA had not given guidance. With no guidance like an FAQ or other document given, later guidance that is at odds with how you interpreted the law 
is almost certainly not going to qualify. Similarly, later guidance that is at odds with how the bank interpreted the law is also almost certainly not going to qualify. It's going to have to be that the SBA put out guidance where they said, and the one case I know this happened was for partnerships, and that's actually, I think, the only case the SBA is going to go with this. And there it was not that they gave guidance that gave you too much, they gave you too little. They put out initial guidance, say partnerships send in only for employees, right, and partners partners don't get it. So if you did right away after the money, you only got for your employees. Later they said, we've, re we've considered this, and partners should actually be part of that original loan which obviously was a problem because you already got your disbursement. So we had issues there. I think except for cases like that where you could point to a specific item of SBA guidance that said, this is my loan amount, and then later guidance changed that and reduced it, which I don't think you're going to find very often, you're not getting out of this. So be aware of that, right? You have to make sure that the actual computation you were looking at at some point was explicitly backed up by the SBA guidance that is binding on the SBA. That's probably going to require finding it in an FAQ or finding it in interim final rule that existed on the date you applied for the loan, which also means you got to check dates for when loan applications went in and when the SBA put out other guidance, all of which can be a mess. So like I say, we've got that. We also put out a procedural notice on the first draw loans. This is when can we get that extra money? Because later the law change or other items, we're allowed to get more than the bank originally approved us for, or we're allowed to get more than we took. Even though we were approved for more, we didn't take it, or we paid it all back. So how can we get that money? This procedural notice, 5000-20076, that was issued on January 13th, provides for that process. The most important thing to notice about this is this is listed as the exclusive list of situations that will qualify for that second draw, for that additional disbursement on your first draw loan where you already took money out under the original program. And there's going to be some big problems here, right? First thing is, this list requires, and they make it very clear, if you have already gotten forgiveness, you absolutely cannot get a second disbursement on the first draw. You are done with the first draw program. This notice makes that very clear. So if you already had forgiveness, and it actually says applied for forgiveness, prior to December 27th, you're out of luck. You need to basically not have started the forgiveness process by that date, and you have to then apply back to the bank. Now, who exactly can get this? The one key category is, you'll notice that they talk about what I mentioned earlier. If you're a partnership that didn't get amounts for your partners, and it's because the SBA initially said that no partners are excluded from the calculation. If you're a partnership, only ask for your employees' wages. Do not include the partnership. That is the only situation the SBA has interpreted as meeting the requirement in the law for a situation where a later IFR changed the process or changed the amount of loan you could qualify for, resulting in an increased amount. I don't care what other thing you think meets that requirement. And I should say the law did say this is based on as the SBA determines. So... Now you got to show that they are abusing their discretion, which is going to be tough, and you're going to litigate them. And yeah, basically, that's not going to be a very likely option that you're going to be able to go down that path for no other reason than financial reasons. Uh, partnerships are it. No other category qualifies under that broad rule. If you took a course from me or anybody else prior to January 6th, or actually prior to this coming out eventually, but January 6th, we got our first hint. This guidance on the 13th is when we found out that, yeah, that's it. Um, we were discussing the broad rule in the, in, the, in the law. This is all that broad rule covers. That's it. Partnerships who do it. Okay. What else can we get it? Well, 
if you were a seasonal employer, we expanded the period for that moving 12 weeks. We look for our highest, we look for the highest amount of wages we paid. If you qualify for more on that, yes, you can file this request. It'll be a first draw request and you have to get it in and the bank needs to process it. And apparently you're going to have to get this money spent before you get a second draw loan. That also is now a thing you're juggling. Do I go for this extra first draw or do I go for second draw? And we still don't have real clarification of what it means to have spent the first draw loan, the funds. But like I say, be careful here. You know, you may have to make a choice between going for this extra fund for seasonal from first draw or going for just a brand new second draw. Because you might not have time to get this spent and then make your second draw. We don't have clarification on that. I told you there are a lot of missing pieces here. So be aware of that, right? Also, I talked about the farmers and ranchers who are self-employed. Again, if you have not applied for forgiveness, right, they go through the methods. And this document also tells the bank how to do it. So if a bank says, we don't know how to do it, you can actually give them this notice and say, here's what the SBA says. Here's what they've issued to you. And the back of your mind, you're thinking that somehow you never noticed they issued. But don't say that out loud, right? Just say it that way. We also have the example here for, for other vendors. Uh, let's say those are the cases where you repaid your entire loan. That's the one case where you're going to be good. Because if you sent all the money back in, right? So you were deemed never to have had a... So you basically paid it all back in last time. You can go back and get it. That one's easy because you would not have any forgiveness. They do say if the bank recorded it wrong, they got to fix that until the procedures, how the bank would do that with the SBA to get that fixed. They also talk about cases where you only spent part of the loan, you paid back the rest. Maybe you're planning to hold the money for reopening. You couldn't reopen, so you only spent part of it. So you immediately sent back the money that you couldn't use. You could get that out again now. Or a one where you just decided to take less than the total draw, maybe for the same reason. You didn't think you'd be able to, you said, I'm not going to be able to get reopened. I'm just going to take the money I can spend. And you didn't take the rest. Those are all put in there is how they go. Now, for the last two categories where you did get some forgivable funds and you could have applied for forgiveness, if you have applied, we're still in trouble here. We can't get the loan reissued. If you paid everything back, you never would have submitted an application for forgiveness. So bottom line, you should be able to get the whole money back. That shouldn't be a problem. Okay, next up, this one's kind of helpful, especially for not not for profits. This is another SBA FAQ. It is the second draw paycheck protection program loans, how to calculate revenue reduction and maximum loan amounts, including what documentation to provide. This was issued on January 19th. Now, under this ruling, what we get is, as we say, the, the way to calculate revenue and, you know, receipts for the 25% reduction. But we also get here, you know, just repeated like it is for the first draw loans, the maximum loan amount. Obviously, the main thing that's different in second draw from first draw is that second draw loans have a special rule for hotels, restaurants, and bars, the NAICS Code 72. So we'll talk a little bit about those too. But Basically, our key thing here is, is it tells us how to compute our revenue, right? And the revenue is for for-profit and not-for-profit organizations. And essentially, right, this tells us what gross receipts are. Now, gross receipts for for-profit, it follows the interim final rule we discussed earlier for what we're going to be. It's going to basically be, you know, your total revenues on the tax basis uh, with capital gains coming out, if you add that in there, and some other adjustments that they talked about in the IFR. Those are repeated word for word here. They didn't add, they didn't repeat that confusing bit that went from the tax return. It's still valid, but it just confused everybody. So this, this time they omit that discussion of adding back cost of sales to, you know, total revenue because that just confused people. They didn't make it clear that it was a tax form computation, and they decided not to try again to explain it that way. So it's not there. But if you look at what we talked about before, I kind of explained how that one would work. But the big issue here is for not-for-profits. Not-for-profits, we know, is gross receipts under 6033. And what they tell us in this FAQ, though, is actually give us some of the details there. So they say, 
this gross receipts includes but is not limited to. So again, it's basically what goes on a 990 generally. So it would include any amounts received as contributions, gifts, grants. A lot of questions I had. You know, do grants count? Grants shouldn't count. I don't think grants should count. Grants don't count, right? Grants count. You have to count grants as revenue. Or any similar amounts without reduction for expenses of raising and collecting such amounts. Okay. And also amounts you receive as dues or assessment from members or affiliated organizations. Again, without reductions for any costs of attributable to the receipt of those amounts. Uh, gross sales or receipts from business activities reported on the 990T. That makes sense. You know, unrelated business income. Uh, yeah. So that's going to kind of look to the for-profit calculation for all practical purposes. Uh, gross amount received from sale of assets without reduction for costs. That one's a little surprising considering that capital gains didn't count for the for-profit business, but apparently gross amounts received from sales of asset will account. And nowhere on the gross amount, nowhere on the revenue for the for-profit, at least on the tax calculation, do they suggest adding back the basis of assets that were reported on a 4797. So that was a little interesting. And, a well, and as well, investment income, uh, such as interest, dividends, rents, and royalties. For a not-for-profit, there is where you're going to find a much more detailed list of what you have to count when trying to come up with your 25% revenue reduction. Now, the reference periods you're going to use, they have that, which is basically what we have in the law, telling us you know, how you compare, what you compare to a quarter for getting your 25% reduction if you weren't in business in 19, you know, various other special, for all of 19, we have all of those special rules. They're in here. Pretty much just repeats what we have uh, in regard. Now, the interesting issue, though, probably a key one is the documentation that we need. And here's the thing. You know, it says the following documentation can be provided to document the reduction in gross receipts. And they list three categories of this. Category one, quarterly financial statements for the entity. If those quarterly financials are not audited, highly likely, then what's going to happen is the borrower is going to have to sign and date the first page of the statement and initial all other pages attesting to their accuracy. If the financial statements do not clearly label the number that should be gross receipts, they probably won't, uh, then you need to annotate the financial statements to point out where those gross receipts numbers are and how they add up. So you need to have these quarterly financials. Presumably, therefore, I need the quarterly financial for 2020. For the, you know, for the quarter I've got here in 2020, I should say, and that same quarter in 19, because I've got to show, compare the two periods. Alternatively, I can go get bank statements, right, that cover the periods in question. And again, I'm going to have to clearly indicate any deposits that do not represent, you know, re income, gross receipts to the business, rather, you know, that may be capital infusions or et cetera. And again, you would apparently need the bank statements for both periods. Or method three, uh, you, if you want to use the annual reduction in revenue numbers, uh, you can compare the 2019 tax return and the 2020 tax return. Now, if you've not filed the 2020 return, which is probably going to be the case, you must fill out the return forms, compute the relevant gross receipt value on the application, right? Sign and date the return, attesting the values that enter gross receipts computations are the same values that will be filed when the actual return is filed. So you're going to have to do that. Those are your documentations. That documentation may prove more of a problem. Now, they do give us a list of details in your information about the tax returns that would go in for the various entity types and what you're going to be providing, right? If you are a fiscal year, though, it's going to be difficult to use your tax return because fiscal year taxpayers can only document a reduction in gross receipts for income tax returns if their fiscal year contains all of the second, third, and fourth quarters of the calendar year. You have to have a fiscal year start date of February 1st, March 1st, or April 1st. Any other fiscal year start date besides those days. So you want to think, we tend to think of year ends. So if your year end is not January, February, or March, you have any other fiscal year end besides December, you can't use tax returns. So you only now have to do either the financial statements or you've got to provide the bank statements. Those will be your options for doing it. The goes into, as I said before, has all the details of the maximum amount of loan by entity type. You can read that on and discover in there as to how they're going to go. 
Uh, we also then have a final clarification on the NAICS code. Remember, in the IFR, we were told if your code was not 72 on the last filed tax return, you're not going to get an NAICS loan. Well, that, that's kind of bad news. Um, and they don't really relieve that. But they do say if the code was left blank, you didn't put a business code on the return, then you can still qualify. If the code is not 72 and you put a code in, you're in trouble. But if you don't have a code in there, then as long as you truly meet the category and you submit other evidence that you do, such as a permit, let's say you know you have a permit from the county health department to serve food to the public, that would be something you'd have to submit along with your statement that you are truly a restaurant or truly a hotel, you know, truly a bar. You'd get your liquor license, etc., you know, to show those things. If you can demonstrate those things, you can prove it with various ways. Then if the code was blank, you're fine. There is no relief if the code is just wrong. It should have been 7-2, but, you know, you're using the nines because that was easier. <sighs> yeah, don't, don't be quite so easy. Finally, want to remind you, we do have the revised forms are out, and we have links to them in the on the website and also in the PDF. You download that from our website for the, this week's updates. It was issued on day 24, so these are revised forms 3508, 3508EZ, and 3508S that came out on January 20th, right? Those forms all dropped, right? The revised 3508S used to, the original 3508S only applied to loans up to 50000 It did effectively, as the SBA points out, say that if you had that loan, you were essentially exempted from the requirements for FTE reduction, right, or rate of pay reduction. You were exempted, and as long as you otherwise spent the funds, you could qualify for up to $50,000 uh, 50, in relief forgiveness as long as you certify to that on the form. Now the number for 3508S goes up to 150000 but they clarify that relief from having to worry about your full-time equivalent numbers or your rate of pay, that only applies to loans up to $50,000. If you have a loan of $50,001, up to $50,000, you have to still uh, you know, worry about the FTE calculation. So you still got to compute that and determine how much of any of that would reduce your forgiveness. Now, the 3508S, which is nice because the law itself implied that you, if you didn't get full forgiveness, you couldn't use the S. You are allowed to indicate an amount of forgiveness less than computed. Well, I said less than computed, less than you borrowed. So you could still use this loan even if you didn't qualify for full forgiveness by reporting the proper amount you qualify for on the form. The 3508EZ and the 3508 standard full form, they basically have just been updated to add the new classes of expenses that are allowed to roll forward some of the safe harbor dates, right? And to roll forward other dates that obviously have changed under the application program. But otherwise, they are basically the same forms we had before with the same information needed. So those aren't really different. So again, all of those are available on the SBA's website. We have links to that with an article on our website on the main news page. Or you can go for this particular audio program, audio or video program, you can go to our website and just be able to, if you download the PDF, the links to all three are in the PDF. So you can have links to each of the forms as they exist. Well, as I said, it's been a full week, but this has been the uh, update for this week of January the 25th, 2021. Uh, be sure you tune in next week so we'll see what's happened and hopefully update you on tax updates. As I tell you always, if you have questions, you can email me, edzollers at currentfulltaxdevelopments.com. Uh, also, check our website, currentfulltaxdevelopments.com, during the week. We do post updates there. Does things happen during the week? I do follow along on the Connect sites for a few state societies, uh, Arizona, New Jersey, Minnesota, uh, Washington, Illinois, I take a look at. So if I do see a question there that I think I could help with, I'll try to step in there. So if you're a member of those societies, you can look in there. Otherwise, have a good week. 
And we'll see what other guidance we get if we get new ERC guidance so we know how that's going to work because I think that's going to be the, the biggest problem we're going to run into with this program is going to be all the employee retention credit issues we're going to have to deal with with our clients that previously we were sure it never it would never matter because they got the loans. Now we have to worry about it. So we'll take a look at that. And I'll be back here next week as we try to do our first update for the month of February as we move into yet the second month of 2021. Yes, we've gone through one month already. So we'll see you next week looking at the whatever's happened in the current week.